Guys, happy in the good evening and welcome to the Colorado Crosses about the Coalition Sport on Stop Over Together. Our community panel. And this time, the subject is embracing Latinx advocacy in Colorado's disability community. At CCDC, we strive for all Coloradans with disabilities to be full, equitable lives and equal access to any civic, professional, and or opportunities that are available to people without disabilities. My name is Jose Torres Vera. I'll be the facilitator today, and I am the co-executive director of the Grupo Vida. Uh, and we have an exciting panel for you tonight, in which we will hear the unique and moving stories from members of the Latinx community advocating for disability rights. Can you, panelists, present yourselves? How about we start with Gabe? Hello, yeah, thanks for inviting me. My name is uh, Gabriel Gates. Uh, uh, you can call me Gabe. I work at Disability Support Services at Front Range Community College, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Stephanie Salazar Rodriguez, and I am the CEO and lead trainer of Blazing Cloud Consulting. It is a small um, public health training and technical assistance um, organization in Denver, and my pronouns are she, her, and Aya. All right, my name is uh, Representative David Ortiz. I represent House District 38. I'm a state representative in Colorado State House. House District 38 is Littleton and Centennial. I'm also a navigator surviving a crash in Afghanistan is what put me in the chair, led to my disability. Um, I've been a lobbyist for veterans. Uh, I got uh, recruited slash tricked into running for office. It's been a privilege serving the community and the community with a disability. Hello, my name is Edgar Morales, and I'm the independent living skills specialist at the Independence Center. And my pronouns are he and he. Thank you for that fabulous introduction. Um, and the, my, our first question tonight is, can you share your journey into the disability advocacy as a person living with a disability um, or your connection to someone living with a disability? Could you highlight any moments that spark your advocacy efforts or a moment that defined you're joining as an advocate. And could we start with Gabe, please? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I guess you can say it started when I was eight years old. I was uh, diagnosed with the uh, eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa, which is a degenerative condition uh, and uh, my eyesight I lost my vision uh, progressively over time. Uh, by the time I was 31, 32 years old, uh, I lost all my functional, uh, usable vision. And uh, I'm 46 now, so uh, I've been living with blindness for about the past 15 years. Uh, I, When I was first told about this condition, I didn't know what to expect. My doctors had told me that I was eventually going to be blind. Uh, so once I, you know, started really losing my vision, I started looking into different types of resources uh, to aid me with my blindness, things like learning Braille, using a cane, those type of things. And by the time I graduated high school, I wasn't sure about what to do, what types of resources were available for students with disabilities. So it took me a while to get into higher education, uh, mostly because I'm a first uh, generation student. So I didn't know where to go or what to do. One day I just got up, got on the bus, went to my local community college at that time was Pikes Peak Community College and just started asking people, what do I do to get started? Where do I go? So I went to enrollment management services, applied, signed up, and then next 
uh, fall semester I was in taking classes. And that's when I found out about disability support services. And they provided me with the resources and tools uh, that aided me in my educational endeavors. So ever since I found out about that resource, I was really interested in that. And I knew right away that I wanted to work in that type of career. I didn't know if it was actually going to be disability support services, but I wanted to serve the disability community, specifically students with disabilities. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. It's always interesting to listen to people who have had their own journey. So thank you for that. Uh, Stephanie, could you answer the question? Do you want me to repeat it? No, no, I got it. Thank you, Jose. Um, my journey actually started when I was probably a teenager. One of my mom's um, friends had a child who was born prof with profound disabilities, both physical and developmental, um, and she was not supposed to live at all. And uh, so we saw the journey of her family where back then there really were no disability services available. So my mother and, well, her mother, and then my mother helped as well, helped take care of her. And it just really, really impacted me. And so as I went through life, um, my first job in the nonprofit sector, um, I was working for an organization called the American GI Form Veterans Outreach Program. And I was working with veterans who were just coming out of Vietnam. And at that time, many of them uh, were experiencing Agent Orange, PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, and the government was not recognizing any of these um, disabilities. And so they were fighting for um, their benefits. And at the time, I didn't know where to go or how, where to send them because none of them had money to get attorneys. And so I went back to school and I became a paralegal. And so as a paralegal, I was able to help them to apply for their veterans benefits and other things that paralegals are allowed to do. And from there, I moved into working with adults with chronic mental health issues. And with many of those individuals, including some members of my own family, I helped them apply for their social security disability, um, even going to see a magistrate because that's how far it had gone where they had been denied. Um, and so we were you know, successfully uh, able to help several people get their social security disability. Um, and then from there, I went to work in early childhood education um, and for the first time, I saw the importance of the impact of um, early intervention and prevention of seeing children in Head Start from zero to five that luckily had the capability of having um, uh, services for children with disabilities, both um, physical disabilities and also developmental delays. And so from there, I just continued my career and I have seen you know, additional people who um, have experienced uh, lots of issues and challenges. And then myself, as I have gotten older, you know, through accidents and injuries, I too now have uh, mobility issues as far as walking and problems with my knees and my legs. And just recently, um, I had some issues when I went to a conference of trying to get some accommodations and ADA for myself and a team member. And I was told by the hotel that because they don't get any government funding that they're exempt from ADA requirements. So it's been a challenge and I've just really seen the importance of, of uh, working with individuals. And now I also work with individuals who may be experiencing a dual diagnosis, which is a mental health diagnosis and also a substance misuse. And so really working to help those people um, get some of the services that they do, um, that are necessary and that they deserve as human beings. So that's kind of my journey. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing that. It, certainly, there's a history of uh, discrimination against people with disabilities. So thank you for highlighting that. Representative Ortiz, could we hear a little bit of your journey? Yeah, absolutely. So the short answer is advocacy has always been a part of who I am and what I've done. Um, starting with my first job, which was resettling evacuees after Hurricane Katrina. I worked for the uh, mayor's office of the city of Houston, their office of international affairs and development, um, and then was a combat aviator in the military. And like I said earlier, surviving crashes would put me in the chair. 
Um, after that, it became about advocating for myself um, because, you know, the, the military was great with burns and amputations, but they weren't used to dealing with a lot of severe polytrauma issues like spinal cord injury. And so their original answer was to farm me out to a VA because it's cheaper for them and that's what they're used to doing. Um, but the VA that I was at was pathetic. It was underfunded. It was, they had staff that were, and I'm not an ageist, but I'll say it like if you're in your seventies and can't be doing your job as a physical therapist, you shouldn't be in that role. Um, and so it was my, uh, main care provider that got me to Craig hospital. And that's when my life turned around, uh, had the army move me here and was medically retired in 2015, started lobbying for veterans in DC and in the state of Denver. And because I am a disabled veteran, I was also advocating and lobbying for disabled veterans. Um, and then I got recruited slash tricked into running for office by <laughs> then state Senator, now Congresswoman uh, Pedersen. So if y'all don't know that name, Brittany, yeah, Pedersen. Brittany Pedersen. Yeah, she's amazing. So she recruited me to run for office um, and I won. So I was the first wheelchair user that ever got elected, um, literally transforming the landscape of the Capitol. And even then, though, I still was dealing with some internalized ableism. I didn't want to be known as the disability rights uh, legislator only. I wanted to prove that I could do all the things. But, um, you know, there were organizations like CCDC and their advocates in disability law and community at large that helped me get over that and proudly started running almost strictly disability rights bill or definitely focused on that. And so that's kind of the, the short version of how I got into advocacy and into this work. Wow, what an impressive story. Thank you, reporters. Uh, so I think we're missing one elder. Please, can you share with us? Yes, so my journey started when I was young. I had a stroke during birth. So I have cerebral palsy. And so I had to learn to do everything by myself. Um, so when my parents from Puerto Rico moved to Florida, so Spanish is my first language. And so when we moved to Florida, the teachers didn't want to help me. The teachers said that I was too disabled and he's never going to learn English. He's never going to turn out to anything and because of my disability and because I spoke Spanish. And so that was before the ADA. So I had to learn to do things by myself. I had to do things differently. I had to be creative because the teachers and nobody were helping me. I had to learn how to advocate for myself throughout the years to ask for that. And since I was young, I didn't. I I was learning how to advocate throughout the years, and you know that the years passed by, and then I advocated more frequently. And so when I turned twenty one, I this is all in Florida. Um, I had a started getting seizures. So I started getting seizures and then so I had to stop college. And then so I found the Center for Independent Living in Florida. And I and I got a job at the Center for Independent Living in Florida as a uh as a peer support slash independent living skills specialist. With that job I learned how to be an advocate for people with disabilities and teach skills ways that other people didn't help me. So I'm passionate of helping people with disabilities become independent. So I had to you know, advocate for that and I had to do things like that. So when I moved to Colorado Springs, I, I was fortunate enough to get the same job. And now I am teaching and advocating and helping other people with disabilities advocate for themselves. And me and my coworker are teaching advocacy and advocacy and disability etiquette to people with disabilities. Wow, all of you are super sad. Thank you for sharing your story. I am so honored to be here to, with all of you tonight. Our second question for you guys is, uh, as an advocate for yourself or someone living with a disability or disabilities, how have you a uh, special, special Sorry, specifically provided support and answer as a resource within your community. And can we start with Gabe? In my career as a disability services professional, I've worked in several fields. 
Uh, it all started with me really in, in higher education. Higher education was the catalyst for my career development as well as my upward economic mobility. Uh, but when I first enrolled and started taking classes at Pikes Peak Community College, uh, not too long after, I found out about the assistive uh, technology computer lab and they were hiring there. So I applied and as a student worker, I became a assistive technology computer lab assistant. And that's when I started working more with other students who had disabilities. I, I really moved from advocating for myself to doing what I can to provide resources and tools to other students with disabilities and just understanding their needs. Uh, I uh, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do as a disability services professional. I just kept on pursuing higher education. At first, I looked into psychology to see if there was a, a need for, you know, counseling and those type of things, a therapy for, for individuals with disabilities. Uh, I kind of changed my mind because I started to realize that I have enough problems of my own. How am I going to try to solve other people's problems? So I looked into uh, special education. So I, I, I moved into special education, became a special education teacher. Uh, you know, started doing, I started in K-12 education, really enjoyed that. Uh, and then as I uh, continued to, to grow, and just learn more about disabilities. Uh, K-12 education really did well with providing resources and tools to students with disabilities through uh, IEPs and, and 504 plans, just providing those accommodations. So success rates were fairly high. I started noticing the success rates and outcomes for students with disabilities in higher education was much lower. So I turned to wanting to work in higher education. After all, uh, that was my desire, you know, once I first entered into higher education. So I started a, a career as a coordinator uh, for disability support services here at Front Range. That's what I do now. I meet with students, do intakes, and just see what I can do to provide them with the accommodations that they need to be successful in the classroom, uh, successful with their tests. Uh, just looking at other different types of assistive technologies uh, that they can use to aid in their own college endeavors, looking at, you know, whatever I can do to remove barriers and fostering principles of universal design throughout higher education. Uh, uh, in uh, my own personal life, I also serve as a, a Lions Club member for the city of Thornton here in Colorado. And I've been doing that for a few years now. And it's just been really meaningful and purposeful for me to serve my community in that capacity. You know, the Lions Club does a lot with uh, working with individuals with disabilities, uh, those who experience uh, social and economic uh, disadvantages. So I've been doing that as while well as trying to just be a, a resource in my community. Uh, but yeah, I've really enjoyed doing this and anything I could do to help uh, individuals with disabilities uh, reach their educational goals. It really warms my heart when students go on to graduate and change the dynamics of their families. Thank you. As I said before, super sad. Thank you so much. Stephanie? Thank you, Jose. Um, you know, as previously stated, you know, I was um, a paralegal and trying to help um, people get their uh, disability benefits. But I also have been a case manager and also a social worker working with families um, to help them uh, gain access to services for their children with disabilities. Um, many times they had no inclination on where to go. They had no idea about the IEP. They had no idea how to get to school to be able to implement the IEP because many times the families had, um, you know, were dealing with the school systems that were just really not ready or especially if they had, we had children who had 
profound disabilities coming out of Head Start and going into public school and just really working with the public school special education department to ensure that these IEPs were implemented. But many, many of the children fell through the cracks and it was very sad um, to see their parents going through so much. And at times they had no idea, you know, what to do. So really trying to be there to advocate for them and to help them provide, you know, to provide some resources for them, I think was extremely important. And, you know, now in some of the work that I do, um, I'm working with people who have more of the invisible disabilities um, and people, you know, don't understand that there may be um, uh, d disabilities that, are, you know, are cognitive delays or even some that are related to trauma. And so um, it seems like when people can't see the disabilities, it's more challenging for people um, because they're trying to explain, you know, what is going on with them. I also have a friend who has a daughter um, with Down syndrome and I try and help her. She's an amazing advocate for her child as well. But uh, there are times when I try to help her as well. So I think just being that resource for individuals, I mean, sometimes I get calls at 10 o'clock at night, Saturday mornings, and I've been working in community for a very, very long time. And people will reach out to me and ask me for resources um, on um, different topics. And many times it has to do with either the visible or uh, invisible disability. So I just continue to try to be there and provide resources and educate myself as well. And, you know, working with CCDC and working with Julie and working with Jose in the past, just really, really embracing what this organization does to help community. Thank you, I can relate. I also get phone calls and texts at <laughs> 6, 7, 10 p.m. So for sympathy or peace, can you share, please? Yeah, so as an advocate, how have I specifically provided support and acted as a resource for my community? Um, I think it cannot be understated how important it is that representation matters, right? I was the first wheelchair user ever elected to the Colorado State House, to the legislature, to the Colorado State legislature in our history. So I literally forced them to transform the landscape of the Capitol just so I could do my job, right? It wasn't accessible for someone with a mobility disability to do their job at the state Capitol. Um, so literally forcing them to do renovations so I could just do my job. Um, some of the other things that we were able to do together was uh, legislative preview day. I implemented that as a way to kind of get hyped and excited for community to come and see what bills we're planning on running to be able to talk to the bill sponsors, ask any questions, and then kind of voice their opinions on what they want to see done before session starts. Not to mention, not to mention DRAD Day, that's what you call it for short, but it's Disability Rights Advocacy Day. Um, and those are some of my favorite days is seeing a bunch of folks with disabilities, whether it's the canes or the wheelchair user service dogs, just hundreds, literally over 200 to 300 people at the Capitol on the House floor as we're honoring advocates of the past, like Judy Human, right? Um, one of my favorite days. So putting that on the map also, I know we've had Disability Rights Advocacy Day before, but not to that level. So being able to see that grow, um, not to mention the list of bills I've worked on, I'm just gonna name a few. I mean, the airport access bill, the Colorado Disability Opportunity Office, the Modify Rental Premises for Persons with Disability, the Motor Vehicle Access for Individuals with Disabilities, the Ballot Access for uh, Candidates with Disabilities, creating a task force to study disability rights in the state of Colorado, prosthetic devices for recreational activities, remedies for persons with disabilities. So that's the anti-discrimination law rewrite that we're doing. Um, there's so many, 23 dis of my bills out of my 69 bills that I've run in my four years have been disability rights bills. It's 33% of my work. Um, so I'm extremely proud of that. And I also wanna point out too, that as a lobbyist on any given year, we were only running zero to three disability rights bills. When I was a lobbyist 2015 to before I got elected, just this last year, we had 15 plus disability rights bills for just this last year, this legislative session. So that's really one of the ways that I've been able to be most impactful in supporting community and, and elevating our voices and making sure our work is being done. Uh, not to mention because I'm such a visible representation that I've got disabled folks from across the state that call me in my offices. Even if they're not my constituent, they will call me directly to help solve their issues. And of course, I don't turn them away. Like that is my job as that visible representation. But what I also do is I loop in their state legislator because I can't be the only disability rights guy. That is your constituent. I make sure I reach out to their state senator or representative to make sure that they learn how to do this work too, right? So that's an important piece of what I like to do. Um, and the last 
thing that, I, that I'll say that I do is I bring silos together. I mean, I love my adaptive sports programs and the adaptive athletes that I work with, but they have their own world and they own their own thing they do. Advocates get in their own world and have their own friends. And what I notice that I tend to do is bring people together from the different silos because the, the more that we work uh, as a team, as a coalition, and especially getting out of our silos of what disability we have, let alone the world that we live in, that's how we're able to pass more and more disability rights bill. That's how we're able to impact change. So that would I would say that's how I've impacted the landscape here the most as an advocate. Wow. So beyond being a representative, you are an organizer like us. Thank you so much. You are certainly one of those people that we need more of. And uh, all of you are, in fact. It's just that sometimes it pays to be in a position of power. So thank you for using that power for us and wisely. So Edgar, could you share with us? Of course. So as an independent living skills specialist, I work with a lot of people with different disabilities. And as a person with disabilities myself, they know that they can come and they can count that, that I will understand them. They know that, that I can support them in the things that I can to support them. I want to empower them. I want them to feel like they are, are able to accomplish anything. I work with a lot of schools and the, the schools will come to me and they know that I will understand the kids, you know, the youth uh, with the adults. You know, I work with youth and adults and all of them. They can, they can come because they know that I will support them because I will understand them. And also, since I'm Hispanic or Puerto Rican, a person with a disability that comes in and sees, hey, there's a person with disability that can understand me. They can come in and they feel more welcome. They feel that somebody can are this there to help them. So that's the way I support them. Oh, thank you. Yeah, definitely having a disability yourself makes you more relatable to people with disabilities. So thank you. It's an actually valuable lesson for all of us. Our next question is, reflecting on your role as an advocate, how have you advocated for yourself and others with disabilities in essential areas like transportation, education, healthcare, employment and so forth. Can we hear from Gay, please? Yes, thank you. So, you know, working in disability support services at Front Range Community College is my full-time job, right? 40 hours a week, I do a day in and day out. I also enjoy collaborating with other disability advocates and, and allies. And just recently, I worked on a Colorado House Bill uh, 221255, which Representative Ortiz sponsored. And I collaborated with uh, the Colorado Department of Higher Education uh, in providing recommendations to the General Assembly on how to improve outcomes for students with disabilities in higher education. I had the honor of chairing a, a committee that worked to provide a 17 comprehensive recommendations through two separate reports to the General Assembly and uh, education affiliates. It was really awesome. I, I, that's, that's full advocacy right there. These recommendations go on beyond the minimal requirements that federal and, and state laws provide to individuals with disability, especially in the, the education, the higher education sector. Uh, I'm also working with the governor's office of information technology. Uh, I'm serving on a steering committee uh, where we're, currently designing, developing different types of digital accessibility trainings and, and workshops for all uh, Coloradians 
with disabilities. And it's just a, a state resource that can be accessed by anybody that provides information and, and resources on how to improve digital accessibility, you know, including websites, digital, any kind of di digital content, uh, documents, forms, those sort of things. So all this work is really meaningful and provides purpose to me. And if I can get anything out of it, it's just gratitude to be able to have the opportunity to pay it forward to my disability community, for my disability community. Thank you. Wow, Gary, I'll be asking you to do a presentation for the Colorado Environmental Disabilities Council now. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, can you share your experience? Absolutely. For me, the two areas that I feel that I'm the most qualified is healthcare access and education. Um, for 10 years, I served on the um, community advisory panel at Denver Health, and that was one of the things that we were looking at was resources and access to healthcare for individuals and families, and specifically with those uh, with a disability. And I was working with Dr. Lilia Cervantes, who was working with the immigrant population who were dealing with end-stage renal failure. And she was a key in helping get the law passed that they would be eligible for um, emergency Medicaid. So I um, did a lot of work in regards to that and doing some advocacy work. And then also working with the uh, Omni Salud which you know, gave uh, undocumented individuals access to health insurance. Now we have the second year. Um, I also served on the um, University of Colorado Anschutz uh, Cancer uh, Community Advisory Panel for two years. And that was really one of the things we were trying to bring was additional cancer services um, to the Latino community. Um, and I also currently now work with AgeWise Colorado, which is now working with elders, especially that have disabilities and some people who are dealing with uh, memory issues such as dementia. And so those are the areas. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, being involved in early ch childhood education for 14 years, that was really something that was so important to me to making sure that these children had the, the, the rights um, to have their IEPs implemented, which as I said previously, but also to really make sure that um, the other um, Head Start programs, I actually was part of the federal auditing teams and I would travel around the country. And I actually, for many years, was in Puerto Rico for quite some time, several weeks out of uh, every summer, and really seeing some of the gaps in the services for children with disabilities in Puerto Rico was really very surprising which was much worse than you know here in the mainland. So as part of that um, group of people um, traveling across the country, I had a, a, the, the um, options to actually see what was going on with children with disabilities in almost all 50 states from uh, Puerto Rico to Alaska. So really to be able to make sure and implement some of those. So the early childhood education piece for me is an absolute priority. Thank you. I can relate completely. I've done some of the work that you have done too. <laughs> it's amazing how, much, how many times I have found people that have done the same things I have done and I have championed amazing stuff for us. Reportees, can you please share? Yeah, so advocating started for myself, started day one um, after I got hurt. Um, because, like I said, the military is really good at what they know and what they're used to experiencing, which was at the time for the conflict we're in, burn victims and amputations. But if it's outside of what they know, they're really bad at it. And so I would put brain injury, severe brain injury and spinal cord injuries as a part of that. Um, so and that led me to fighting for my own care to eventually get to Craig Hospital. That changed my life. But if I was going to go through it, it wasn't just going to be about me. So I started being a bridge and making sure that the Warrior Transition Battalion out of Fort Sam Houston, started uh, fostering a stronger relationship with Craig Hospital so more vet, so more service members could get their care there. Um, as far as advocating for others in transportation, education, healthcare, and employment, like I can just rattle off some of the bills, the airport access requirements, like that clearly impacts so many of us, especially when you have a mobility device um, traveling through the airport. So that was a big groundbreaking bill. Motor vehicle access for individuals with disabilities. There's two separate bills that I ran there. One mandated that if 
car rental companies can make baby seats and ski racks available on their websites, then I shouldn't have to call a stupid separate but not equal number to reserve my hand controls on my vehicle. So mandated that they have to make them available on their websites and they're, they are uh, accountable for fulfilling that reservation within a certain amount of time. Not, you know, for the big airport at DIA, it's not 72 hours or 24 hours, absolutely not. So we reduced the time that they were able to make those reservations. Um, the other bill was getting uh, car rental companies like the peer-to-peer -peer car rental companies or like the Airbnb of car rental companies. The one thing that I got them to do proactively, and I'll give them kudos because Truro, Get A Ride, all these companies, the CEOs spent their time to sit at the table and stakehold with me and proactively help me write this bill where they're now a filter for if you have a vehicle that you want to rent out that has accessible features, let's say you're going to be out of town and you want to do a side hustle and make some money, you can't. And if you're a person that needs to rent a vehicle that has, that needs a, that has accessible options and you can find them. So that was a big groundbreaking bill there. It also created stronger teeth around protecting the ramps that go up sidewalks and parking lots, and then also protecting the parking spots in general in a stronger way, um, as well as making sure that as EV charging stations get, uh, get uh, installed, that we're making those charging stations accessible. So those are those two bills around transportation as well. Um, for housing, it was modify rental premises, persons with disabilities. So protecting and making sure that if there are uh, accessibility options that are installed on an apartment unit, that the renter is not then responsible for removing and paying their own money to remove those accessibility features. So that was a big bill. Not to mention that on the task force, there's a housing uh, subcommittee. If you've not been, go to DOOR's website, find out when those meetings are. We need your voice because they're gonna be passing laws that impact housing and accessible housing here in the state of Colorado. Um, around healthcare, there's the right to repair bill for Medicaid and for private consumers that I got passed with Rep to Tone, who's been amazing for right to repair, not to mention prohibiting discrimination for organ transplant, transplant recipients. So there was a, a some, not all, but some places were really bad about not allowing people with certain disabilities to be recipients of certain organs. They were being discriminated against. So we passed a law to stop that. Um, when it comes to education, I mean, Gabe already mentioned it and I want to get his contact after this because I have a constituent, not mine, that reached out that said they're getting discriminated against at MSU um, for their disability. Um, and so even though that bill is passed, it's not over, it's not done. Um, but, you know, that was a start for making sure we're stopping that discrimination. I only get three minutes, so I could keep going on and on about the different employment, housing. Um, if you want to find more, out more, please reach out to my offices. But it's areas that we need to continue working on. Last thing I'll say is the Colorado Disability Opportunity Office is the intersectionality of all of that because they're supposed to be a hub uh, that works with the Gov's office, the legislature, the attorney general, all the departments, for-profit entities and nonprofit entities to, to secure basic access. And employment, healthcare, you better believe all of that falls underneath there. So if you're an advocate, please get to know those people that ended up that end up getting hired for those positions and get ready to work closely with them. And I'll leave it at that. Well, once more amazing work. Thank you, Representative Dorothy. And I would like to hear from Erica. So I have I um I have a stroke and I um I can't drive. So I have to depend on transportation. And transportation in Colorado Springs is not so good. You know, I get stranded, I get left, I get forgotten. And so me and my coworker had to uh, uh, be part of a committee for transportation to advocate for people with disabilities because us, we're not the only ones that are having trouble uh, with transportation. You know, one of, well, that's one of the main things that we have trouble. So me and my coworker are part of this committee about transportation, how to advocate for better transportation, you know, improving transportation, um, understanding their disabilities, it, you know, understanding uh, why we need the transportation. You know, some drivers don't understand how to deal with different types of disabilities. Um, with education, since I'm an independent living skills specialist, I educate, you know, I teach, and I teach from experience. You know, I teach from the struggles that I've went through. So I so people understand. And I am closely working with the schools 
So I teach, you know, and I go to the schools and work with students. Um, also, with employment, I can say I'm a example. You know, one of one of the unique things about the independent center is that 51% of the employees have disabilities. So when people come in and see people with disabilities working, they get motivated. Wow, I can work. I can have a real job. I can, you know, I can be independent. And because a lot of people with disabilities don't feel that way because they've been discriminated, especially when you're disabled and Spanish is your first language. I'm reaching out to you too. Thank you, <laughs> Uh, yeah, certainly, uh, advocating from a perspective and teaching from that perspective is very powerful. So our next question is, where do you find the motivation and resilience to continue advocacy work for people living with a disability or multiple disabilities? And of course, we'll start with Gabe. Uh, Sabes, when I first started working and wanting to move into a disability service profession, back in 2005, I was working there in the assistive technology lab, and I took a break. Uh, you know, and usually when I took a break, it was just a little quick break on the job because it was just a part-time job, and I'd go outside. And it was in Colorado Springs right there, Pikes Peak Community College, which is now Pikes Peak State College. And I would just look at the mountain range right there, which was right at the foot of Cheyenne Mountain, you know, beautiful view. I knew there was gonna be time, a time where I wasn't gonna be able to see these mountains anymore. But as I was taking my break and I, I walked back in, one of the students that I worked with came out, approached me and asked me, if I could check their urine bag, of course, it was totally unexpected. The student was uh, used a, a wheelchair, had very limited use of their their limbs, and uh, had a catheter and uh, needed a urine bag. So, you know, uh, of course, I was like, yeah, you know, just tell me what I need to do. And he said, well, the urine bag is on, on my right leg uh, by my calf. Can you just feel it? To, Tell me if it feels like it's full. So I, you know, I didn't know what to do or how, how to really measure to tell if it's full. It, I felt it and it didn't, it wasn't bolting or anything like that. So I said, it, it doesn't seem full, seems by halfway. It was at that point in time that I knew that other people's disabilities were more important to me than my own. So if I ever had any type of internalized victimhood because of my disability, it was totally wiped out at that time. My young adulthood, I really started to grow and knew that I wanted to advocate for other people's disabilities, you know, por mi gente con discapacidad. And I've always been passionate about doing whatever I can to amplify the voices of individuals with disabilities within my community. I don't have all the answers or all the solutions, all the, the best resources and ensuring that everything that's out there is adequate for individuals with disabilities. I do know that this type of work starts with compassion a general care for people with disabilities, lots of community organizing, talking and giving people opportunities to come to the table and share their needs, share their ideas, which I commend the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition for providing this opportunity. This is where the power is. The power is in those people who can come and speak out loud and amplify the voices of the disability community to talk about what their needs are because we can't stop doing this. I commend all the allies, all the advocates for everything that they do because it is a constant fight and we can't stop. If we stop, then we're either 
forgotten or left behind at the least. You know, when I first started working in education, one of the things that I learned early on was that students didn't care how much I, I knew, how much I know. They wanted to know that I cared. And ever since then, I've done everything I can to support my disability community, putting them first, making sure they have opportunities to, to grow and thrive in their communities. Thank you for this opportunity. Again, I, I commend uh, everybody that's part of this. I also want to commend our governor, Jared Polis, for signing a lot of these house bills that are specific to disability rights. It's awesome to know that we live in a state that has seen as a leader for disability rights going above and beyond what you find in federal laws. Thank you again. We're certainly proud of that we are, we were the first. Colorado was the first. So thank you for that again. Really inspirational. Stefan? You know, as I sit here and I think about that and, you know, Gabe talks about compassion to me, you know, that is so imperative. Um, I start recalling, you know, many years ago when cell phones were just coming into existence, my sister who had a disability from a back injury and she also had mental health issues, she's now um, has passed away, but she was in a hospital in Pueblo and um, they, she was on blood thinners. And when they did this back surgery, um, they didn't stop the blood thinners in time. So she was still bleeding excessively. And when the nursing staff looked at her chart and they saw the medication that she was taking for mental health issues, they said that, you know, she was just uh, causing too many problems and asking for too much from the nursing staff. And they, uh, they moved her to the farthest room from the nurse's station and they disconnected her nurse call button. So uh, by the time she, we got, she got a hold of us at that time, we lived in Southeastern Colorado about, uh, in Rocky Forts, about an hour from Pueblo, we we drove to the hospital, my brother and myself. And um, when we got there, my sister was laying in a pool of blood and just in tears, just crying uncontrollably and said, you know, shared with us what the nurses had done. And so it was one of the most horrific situations that I had seen in my life in dealing with people who had a physical and a mental health disability. And my brother was so angry. And today he would probably not have gotten away with this, but we called the charge nurse who happens to be a male. And my brother said, what's going on here? Am I going to have to start kicking some ass? And they were like, well, we don't know what you're talking about. And my brother said, look at, look at my sister. And that's what keeps me going in this world. Can move on, Jose. Thank you, Stephanie. I think we all in this panel, and even myself, have had those experiences, and we feel your heart. And thank you for sharing it so openly and so honestly. Reporters. Yeah, that was beautiful. And I just want to piggyback off that because I think family is one of always my biggest motivators, right? Like when I was first injured and knocking on death's door, uh, it was my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sister that were there right away, right? Supporting me. It was my family of brother and sister veterans that showed up when I was in the medical ICU, right? Um, my friends, my family, they are what motivate me the most. Like there's a hierarchy, right? Like that's always what drives me to to serve and to do amazing things. Um after that, it's community living with a disability, right? Because for too long, we have gone without being able to have real power, right? 
And we always have to fight for it. We always have to claw for it. We have to protest. We have to get out of our chairs and climb upstairs just for them to give us basic access. That's what finally got the ADA to pass in 1990 was a bunch of disabled folks getting out of their chair and climbing up steps. That's what it took. And that was the start. That's the floor. A lot that some people still, after 34 years, think is optional, think is optional. So to be able to have the privilege to represent this community in a very tangible and real way, passing a lot of these disability rights bills, um, that's what motivates me. I don't care if they're blind, they have cerebral palsy, spina bifida, it does not matter. We are all one big family. And here's what able-bodied folks out there need to realize, is this is a family that anyone can join at any time. And if you live long enough, guess what? You will get there. I promise you that. And what's going to make it less, less isolating when you get old is the fact that we all here that you see on this panel fought for basic access and fought for disability rights. That's what's going to make it. So if and when you do get injured or if and when you do have a child that's born with a disability or if and when you age long enough and have mobility issues, that you're not isolated to a nursing home in your room. It's because these folks right here fought for that basic access and for those rights. And so that's what motivates me. Seeing those people on the House floor during Disability Rights Advocacy Day, seeing y'all wheel around and cane around, whatever, you know, talking to legislators and interacting with legislators, that's what keeps me motivated and rejuvenates me, so. Same here, reporters. That's what motivates me too. And I would like to hear from Eva as well. So what motivates me? Mi familia. Mi familia is my support system. They believe me. They understand me. They, they encourage me. They empower me. You know, I went, I didn't have no many friends during my school years because I was bullied. I was seen as an alien. When I was young, I had to wear a brace in my hand and my foot, and people were scared to even look at me. I had to, I was out of, you know, with no friends, with no nobody. And I, I had to find ways to, to be motivated. So mi familia motivated me. And also my family, my friends. Some of my friends, I had good friends that they didn't even see my disability. They forgot that I had disability because they saw who I am. They didn't see my disability. You know, some people see your disability and they're like, oh, but you know, others, they don't see their disability. So th my close friends, those motivate me. So mi familia and my close friends motivate me. And also my students, my students, when I see them get empowered and try new things, you know, that makes me happy that they're able to accomplish things that never, that they never thought of. You know, I'm going to give an example. A couple of years ago, I had a consumer that she participated in some of my classes, but she didn't believe in herself because nobody believed in her. So when I, when I told her, you can, I'm here to support you. I'm here to understand you, you know, and so she started participating and she became happier because she had somebody that supported her and motivated her. And after she graduated from my program, a couple of months later, she called me and said, thank you. I just want to say thank you for believing me and motivating me because of what you did. I moved to Denver and now I'm independent. You know, and that's what motivates me is, is seeing those great things, you know, one person can make a difference. Sometimes we don't think that we can make a difference. You know, we can make a difference in our own way. And that right there is the principle of community organizers, right, Edgar? Thank you so much. Thank you for to everyone, because this, is, this panel has been not just inspirational, but real. This is a real story. And when you said, reportees, for example, about having to fight for every right, for every ounce that we can get, I have that experience as well. We want to thank you all, our panelists, for sharing their stories and all the work that you have done 
as advocates for the disability movement. And we want to thank you for attending this webinar uh, and spending the evening with us. Uh, if you want to stay up to date about the work that CCDC does, uh, I want to invite you to visit our social media website, etc. We also have a newsletter that you can subscribe to and get information of what CDC is doing in the community. I um, I represent El Grupo Vida. We, we also help people with disabilities in the Latino community. Our organization is fully bilingual. And I would I love and I'm proud to say that we are part of the coalition that CCDC has created for 32 years now. And we also belong to other uh, coalitions of Latino and BIPOC uh, organizations. And if you want to go to learn more about us, you can go to elgrupovida.org. Thank you so much and have a good night, all of you.